Good evening, everyone. We're going to begin our meeting here in about two seconds on a formal level. So welcome, everyone. All right. I hereby call this meeting of the Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District to order. And uh, would you please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. We now have our Metro Cable announcement. The open session meeting is videotaped for Cablecast on Metro Cable 14. Replay on Saturday, March 24th, 2018 at 12 noon. And Monday, March 26th, 2018 at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. Webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. The open session meetings are also available for viewing on the district website at www.metrofire.ca.gov. We now come to the public opportunity to discuss matters of public interest within uh, district jurisdiction, including items on or not on the agenda. Madam Speaker, do we have any? Uh, it does appear we have one speaker this evening. Oh, uh, welcome. Sir, if you'd like to step up to the podium, I'll make sure the microphone is on and I think this is, uh, give you a moment to speak. Hello. Welcome, Ray. Nice to see you. I'm Ray Really. I am on the board of the Citrus Heights Water District, but I'm not here to address that issue. Right now, I'd like to thank your board clerk, Melissa. I live on Larkspur Lane in Orangevale, which is just near Oak and Kenneth. And we had somebody decide to put a, a, a speed bump on the end of the street. And I requested from the district because the county doesn't have a th apparent authority on a non-county road, but I know fire equipment needs to get up and down the road. So I requested that you take a look at this and see if we can have this uh, impediment removed. And shortly after I sent the email, I got a call, and I believe the issue is being addressed, and I just wanted to thank you for the timely response because it's I sitting on a board I understand how the public hits you with stuff and they don't always come back and acknowledge the good work that's been done it hasn't resolved the issue yet but I look forward to seeing that happen soon well thank you very much for the feedback loop it's greatly greatly appreciated and thank you madam clerk for following up on uh, Ray's issue uh, thank thanks you very a lot. much take care Okay. We are now on uh, consent items, and if there are no Madam questions. Madam Chair, I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Director Gale. I didn't hear. I didn't hear what it was. Okay. And Director Gould. Uh, uh, it's okay. Uh, Director Gale, we're on the consent item. What, what, which one? The consent items. Yeah. Minutes and uh, oh, financial services. Aye. Director Orzali. Aye. Director Sheets. Aye. Director Wood. Aye. Director Clark. Aye. Director Kelly. Aye. And Director Jones. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Moving on to presentation items. We have Fill the Boot for Burns, Chief's Challenge Award. Uh, <laughs> Mike, Mr. Mike Dahl. Welcome to the podium. Thank you very much. Got my lovely assistant here, Delaney. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's always a joy being here. A um, little bit about myself. I, you guys uh, gave me a resolution when I retired a couple of years ago, and I didn't say thank you. I didn't know how much, uh, uh, how important that was to me until I hung in my office. Had a quick little review of my career, and I was... Um, very thankful to have that, so I do appreciate that. I think that's a very kind gesture. And um, it, we did miss one thing on there, though, and it was very important to me. I was here, the highlight of my career, actually, was getting a uh, presentation, not unlike what I'm going to do tonight, but uh, for my involvement with the Fill the Boot for Burns and uh, the Firefighters Burn Institute. And uh, 
Forrest Rowell and I Battalion 5 B-Shift, um, living up in that fire truck for 20 years, um, <laughs> got recognized for doing that. And it was like the, it, it was an unbelievable feeling for me to get that award tonight. I don't know that Chief Harms is going to get that same feeling tonight, because <laughs> I think he may have done some other cool stuff besides living in a fire truck. But I will tell you that um, with the, the Chief's Challenge that we have during the Fill the Boot for Burns event, this is the 11th year that we've done this. And, um, you know, it's had varying levels of, uh, of earnings, so to speak. And this year, um, there was a really big push. And by Chief Harms himself, I was uh, unbelievably astounded at how much money he raised. I actually thought that, uh, that uh, Chief, Mc Chief McLaughlin from Kasumas was going to beat him. But uh, that was not the case. Um, as you guys know... Um, uh, Chief Harms is connected to Burn Foundations uh, through Arizona Burn Foundation and has taken on ours wholeheartedly, which I greatly appreciate. It's um, uh, that push that you're giving us is um, worth its weight in gold. And unfortunately, the trophy is not made of gold, but it has sat in your office many times and it's going to be back there uh, starting tonight. So for those interested... Chief Harms and his esteemed colleagues raised uh, ten thousand sixty-six dollars, which um, uh, singularly is just a record breaker. And then overall, all the chiefs—we had six chiefs: uh, Kasumnis, Sacramento, Sacramento County Airports, Roseville, and Folsom—and they raised seventeen thousand twenty-one dollars. This has never happened before. And so, to put dollars and cents to what it does for our programs, um, that is. Uh, 34 kids to camp, it's eight nurses to the American Burn Association Conference, stuff like that. So you can actually start putting, um, putting some reality to what these dollars do. And uh, as a foundation, even though we're very small, we have an impact that's actually nationwide. And I couldn't do it without uh, Metro Fire's involvement and certainly with Chief Harm uh, at the helm, uh, you know, pushing that. I do appreciate that. So um, I have a couple at, at my lovely assistant here so i have a plaque for for the for the district i don't know where that one goes and i guess chief you can have all these <laughs> <laughs> okay we're going to shake hands and lean towards the paparazzi i think oh, it's around here somewhere so thank you thank you sir that's uh, for the district here's one for you personally all right it's almost the same, but <laughs> different. It has your name on it. <laughs> and then the perpetual trophy, which uh, can I get a collective ooh and ah? This is. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Oh, That's a wrist breaker right there. Oh, yeah. There we go. Here, come on. Delaney, get in there. Get in there. Come on. Somebody. Get in there. There we go. We've got to have the assistant in there, right? That's right. Let me get that, that clock out there. Let's go in front of the uh, screen. Oh, Let's do that. Go that way. Go that way. Where are you guys going? It's okay. Hey, You know he's on TV. He's been on the whole time. Come on. You guys have been involved in the boot drive many times. It's okay. Put your lovely assistant up front. We don't get asked questions of Mr. Dahl. Mr. Dahl, I think he needs to stay there. I don't think we've released him yet. All right, thank you, Mr. Daw. And uh, Chief, congratulations. Uh, you can put that in the weight room and work out with it, yeah. Okay, thank you again. Thank yeah. you very much. Round of applause. Thank you. Okay, thank you again. All right, presentation item number two, arson division update. Uh, Assistant Chief Wagaman <clears throat> and Supervising Investigator Barsdale will give us a presentation. Welcome to the podium, gentlemen. 
Thank you. Uh, good evening, Tyler Wagaman, Assistant Chief Operations on the B-Shift, as well as the distinct honor to oversee the Fire Arson Investigations Unit. Uh, recently, we, re we received a request from Director Orzali uh, to provide the board with some specific information uh, regarding the investigations unit operation as a whole. Supervising Investigator John Barsdale has worked hard putting together a presentation for you this evening. And uh, with that, I would like to turn the microphone over to Investigator Barsdale. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Chief Feigeman. Uh, Board of Directors, Chief Harms, staff, uh, good evening. Before I go into the presentation, a little background on who I am. Uh, my name is John Barsdale. I'm the supervising investigator for, for the fire investigation. I have been with the agency about 20 years now. Um, my family has been involved in the fire service for over 50 years in this region with successor districts. Um, I'm married to Lisa Barzo, who's a deputy fire marshal in CRRD, and my brother Brent works at Station 106 B Shift at, at, on the truck as the engineer. You've all seen me over the past five years as director of 522. I've been managing the fire investigation unit for the past four years. Some of the task force fundamentals uh, that we do at the, in the arson unit is um, it's, uh, the task force goal is to develop procedural practices to sufficiently investigate all crimes related to fire and explosive incidents within the unincorporated areas of the county. What this means is that since we've joined a task force with the Sheriff's Department, EOD division, we cover some areas outside of Metro's uh, jurisdiction. If I can figure out which one to turn to the next slide. Okay. A little bit of a background in history. In the late 80s, local fire agencies took over fi uh, full fire investigations in the county of Sacramento. The Sacramento Sheriff's Department did not have dedicated staff to investigate the growing number of fires occurring in the county. The American River Fire District and the Sacramento County Fire District were the largest two agencies in the unincorporated areas of the county with the dedicated fire investigators. American River had two full-time investigators augmented with fire inspectors as needed and clerical. Un uh, Sacramento County had two full-time investigators at the time of the merger. With the merger of both agencies in 2000, the division consisted of four full-time investigators, one supervisor, three investigators, with one full-time clerical. <clears throat> Following the merger and, and development of the Metro Fire, Metro Fire's Fire Investigation Unit, FIU, staffing was increased to six in 2006. The staff changed to 24-hour shifts to, respond, to provide investigative services around the clock to reduce after-hour response times. In 2009, due to the downturn in the economy, the FIU was reduced to 70% by 70%. The staffing consisted of a supervisor, two investigators spread across three sh shifts. The FIU lost three investigators, one juvenile fire setter coordinator, and clerical. In 2014, as an effort to provide additional support, research and development was conducted in a task force concept with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department Explosive Ordnance Division, EOD. The EOD was comprised of seven part-time members, each having other full-time duties. After much discussion and planning, a proposal was presented to the County Board of Supervisors for funding the necessary sheriff deputy positions to fully staff the task force. The County Board approved the staffing, one sergeant, two, two detective positions for the task force. The current staffing for the arson bomb task force is one supervising investigator, two fire investigators, one on each shift for 24 hour shift or 4896. One EOD sergeant and two EOD detectives, which work a 10 hour schedule, a 410 schedule days, Mondays through Thursdays.
how the task force functions. The three Metro members of the FIU work at 4896 schedule responding to calls for service. The investigations, investigators' primary duties is to determine the origin and cause of fires in the district. The three EOD detectives assist with large-scale fire and scenes investigations and conduct follow-up on cases. All respond to active shooter and civil unrest incidents. Other duties that, that the fire investigators do is to assist the bomb squad with destructive devices calls, uh, Molotov cocktails, uh, field of identification of destructive devices, and to relay back to the task force members and the EOD squad. These are some of the examples of what we've collected over the years. The above items were uh, turned into Station 42, and they were included military and, and aerial mortars, uh, simulated hand grenades in the center picture, and then military blasting fuses for, um, were all turned in at Station 42. Fireworks enforcement. It's something that we do every year. Uh, we currently... Um, start patrolling for fireworks from the 28th of June through July 5th. Um, what's depicted in the picture is one of the bus. We, we average at least one large-scale bus a year. Um, this, this particular one, we collected about 2,500 pounds of uh, illegal fireworks. A re regional D EOD training was conducted at Station 52. Since we, we kind of combined the units, we kind of cross-train with some of the tasks that we can help uh, the bomb squad with. Um, they went out there to use uh, some of our burn buildings to run the robots through so they can manipulate tight quarters with them and see what they need to work on and what they don't. They've also used the Zinfandel scene, uh, area um, several times now for the same thing. They've used the bust and then some of the concrete structures out there it's just to manipulate the robots so that they can do different areas just to broaden their skill set. The ongoing threat. <clears throat> the fire investigative unit members of the arson and bomb task force respond to a variety of law enforcement incidents ranging from arson homicide to officers, officer down calls. The attached photo is from the active shooter incident that took the life of a Sac County Sheriff deputy and wounded two CHP officers. Five members of our ta arson task force were among the first on scene. The ongoing relationship our investigators have with local law enforcement has been advantageous in large-scale incidents to help mitigate all types of incidents. Note the fire engine in the background of the photo, upper right-hand corner. Training. The members of the fire investigation unit train to the same standards as the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department members. All weapons and qualification training is provided through the Sheriff's Department. Members are required to qualify on a biannual basis. Advanced Officer Training, AOT, is offered to fire investigators on a biannual basis through the Sheriff's Department. Continuing fire investigation training is provided by the California Conference of Arson Investigators on an annual basis, as well as updated fire investigation training through the SAC Regional Arson Task Force. Uh, some of the training is butane oil labs, uh, updates on NFPA 921, the, the continuing education brings us into compliance with NFPA 1033, the continuing education requirements for fire investigators. To effectively prepare for ever-changing environment, environmental conditions, the fire investigator unit continually identifies new training methods to challenge, to challenge our members. Safety equipment, protective clothing. The fire investigators are equipped with all the same safety equipment as the firefighters. Structural and wildland turnouts, helmets, gloves, access to self-contained breathing apparatus, safety glasses and goggles, etc. We also adhere to the Sheriff's Department's general orders, as did, and we have adopted or pretty much it's their their policy manual on how they conduct and do their investigations. Under the general orders, Metro Fire has adopted the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department general operation orders. The district provides its investigators with the same safety equipment that is an issue to patrol level deputies. Tactical vests, ballistic helmet, chemical agent, handcuffs, impact weapon, sidearm, and patrol rifle. This is the current, with the exception of Mike McGee, who's between uh, Investigator Johnson and myself. He retired in December, and I'm proud to 
announced that um, Chris Rogers uh, from Sonora, and he went through our testing process, and he'll be starting with us the 11th of next month. And that's the end of my presentation. If there's any questions. Any questions from board members? Director Ozali? Well, uh, John, thank you so much for this. Um, I know I was a major pain in the rear uh, in bringing this about, and I apologize for that a little bit. Um, have we ever had an incident in which uh, one of our officers was called to assist uh, another law enforcement agency, or do we or do we respond automatically? Say, uh, for example, to um, somebody. We, uh, d uh, well, before I bungle this any further, go ahead and tell me what you think. Um, like the one I depicted in in my presentation, that was that was immediate need. So, okay, to, to kind of answer your question. We, we don't just go for calls for service for the Sheriff's Department or any other law enforcement agency. We have their same radio frequency, mm -hmm. so we do monitor their radio. So if we happen to be there and it's one of those hot or hazardous calls, we will go and assist. Mm -hmm. um, but And vice versa for us as they do the same. Because we, when we go to a fire scene or we're out doing our follow-up and stuff in criminal investigations, we put ourselves out with the Sheriff's Department where our location is so that if any time we need help, we just key the mic and they send the units our way. So th thinking about uh, an event, let's say, a, God forbid, an active shooter on a, on a campus or a mall, do we automatically re respond to that? Just Yes, we do, sir, just like the firefighters. Okay, and so we automatically respond to that. And then what happens when we show up? We How do you identify who's in charge of the incident? Well, we've all been through the training. Um, our, our role is a little different than the firefighters since we have the training and the equipment to aid our brother law enforcement and sister law enforcement officers. Um, what we're trained is, is once two, two peace officers are there, we're, we go in. Mm -hmm. So if we're the first, one of the first two people there, we go. Mm -hmm. And l last question, have we in Metro's history had an event where we where shots were fired by our staff never yeah. uh, well john i and once again i apologize for driving you nuts with this i just think it that what you do is phenomenally important mm -hmm. and that it also represents a significant potential liability for the for the department and so i felt the board ought to be uh, aware of you and congratulate you on the work that you do thank you thank sir. you thank you are there any other questions or comments from the board? All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, I'm so glad to hear that this is a great display of professionalism working with all of our law enforcement partners as one unit, one team. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, sir. You, you mentioned integrating your police force. In my school district, Twin River School District, we have a police department. Are you involved with them? Are they involved in the same procedure? You remember, so um, just rest and whatever. Only when the, when, when the schools, we have an incident at one of the schools. We actually have had one in the last two weeks. I had one this last rotation two days ago at a school where a juvenile set the bathroom on fire. An amazing thing about my school district, we have schools in the city and in the county. Who Who is control of that? We spend a couple of million dollars on a private police force for that district. I, t I brought it before the board of mm -hmm. Sacramento City, and let's get some kind of update on how we're going to handle that. Sometimes they forget that we have schools in the city and county. I only could speak to the, the scenes that involve uh, Sac Metro, the mm -hmm. stuff that happens in the city that I think the, the city PD takes care of that with them. Thank you. Okay. you bet. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you, thank you so much for the presentation. Mm -hmm. All right. We're moving on to action items. Number one is Copter 2, a lift and floor beam modification. We have Deputy Chief Bridge for a presentation, and this is an action item to approve the recommendation. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening, Directors. Chief Harms, uh, Eric Bridge, uh, Operations Chief. This evening I am brought with me our chief pilot, uh, Monty Van Landingham, as uh, he'll be able to 
speak to some of the uh, maybe some of the technical questions if you have any on regarding our, our request to uh, improve the structural strengthening of our aircraft. So with that, I'll give it to Monty. Uh, thank you, my members of the board, for inviting me here tonight. Chief Arms and Ms. Pena. Um, Deputy Chief uh, Bridge asked me to come here tonight to, to discuss this proposal on the modification for Copter 2, which is basically what we're trying to do is install what we call a 212 lift beam. Um, as you know, a couple of years ago, we modified our Firecopter 1 with the complete modification. One of the major projects uh, that we did, or one of the main emphasis that we had on that project, was the installation of this 212 lift beam. And what the 212 lift beam does, it's a structural membrane that goes into the aircraft, which does two major things for us. Uh, the first one is it increases your total lift capability of the aircraft. So you basically go from 9,500 pounds to 10,500 pounds. So even though that doesn't seem like a significant amount of weight, uh, with the type of missions that we're flying, with the type of loads that we're doing, it is, it is pretty considerable with what we're doing. But really, I think one of the major um, uh, components of this 212 lift beam that is beneficial to, for the aircraft is because it enhances the structural integrity of the aircraft. So these are basically leg legacy aircraft that we're operating in. So the airframes are significantly old, but what happens here is that with the installation of the 212 lift beam, any type of significant loads that we do have on a continuous basis, it cuts down on the maintenance of, of any type of structural damage that we might have. So even though we currently only lift 9,500 pounds continuously at the most on these aircraft, when you do that over the years, structural problems start to happen. And so when that does happen, then obviously that incurs a cost for the department to repair those type of, uh, of damages. As you also know, we've uh, just recently had the incident with uh, Copter 2 uh, on June 16th, which uh, was due to a hydraulic failure. And so since we had that aircraft down for those repairs at this time, what we'd like to try to do is go ahead and install that 212 lift beam also in Copter 2. So that way we keep the aircraft standardized. And obviously, just like what I was talking about before, it will um, keep that structural integrity of the aircraft for, uh, for more years, uh, what, should I, what should I say, operational for more years than we, uh, than we would expect. Any questions? I got a question. All right, let's see. Um, I believe Director Orzali, and then we'll go to Director Gale, okay. and whoever else will put on the list. You mentioned the age of the airframes. Uh, what would you expect? At what point do they just become unserviceable? Or is it, is well, that's, that's really hard to tell. So um, really, these aircraft can last pretty much for, I would say, for another 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. you know, it, really, it really comes down to the type of maintenance that we're going to perform on those aircraft. Every year we do an annual on those aircraft. We go through the structural membranes of the aircraft. We inspect them and so forth. So if any type of damages occur at that time, we catch them in an early phase of it and we repair them. But like I was saying earlier, uh, and we have found this in the past without the 212 lift being in Copter 1 part installation, that we did find those structural cracks in the aircraft, and then that incurred a cost in the department to have them repaired. Since we put the, the lift beam in Copter 1, we've had no damages to those airframes upon inspections. And that's what we're trying to do here with Copter 2 is not only increase that, like I said, the lift capability of it, but also to increase the lifespan of those aircraft in the future, whatever it, whatever it may hold for the department. Director Gale. I think that's a great uh, use of money expended on those. There are some Bell Era Cobras that have been around 40 years. And when you do your x rays mm -hmm. and you structure it interior, it'll go on forever, really. It will. It will. Absolutely correct. That's, that's a great mm -hmm. yes. use of money. Yes, it is. And, and the other benefit to having the 212 lift beam now, we weren't actually, to tell you the truth, we, were, we weren't actually anticipating putting that lift beam in for another two to three years. But since we had the aircraft incident, 
we're trying to take an unfortunate incident and make it better by, okay, now it's tore down, it's completely open, there's no additional cost to the department to have that beam installed, only just for the part itself. So we're now we're just trying to take advantage of, of this opportunity here. That way you don't have to have the guys jump out for your crack points and whatever you <laughs> and it does. Mm -hmm. It's well spent money. Mm -hmm. Extremely well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Director Gould. Madam Chair, thank you. I, I was just going to say, I think that's really the key point right here is that given an unfortunate situation that the copter experienced, we're at a position where this is the ideal time to do it. And I think it's important that the, the public understand that y'all weren't just sitting in the hangar deciding what you could do to make copter two more pretty, is that this is down under for repair for something that was already uh, uh, had been accomplished. Yeah. And so I think this is, a, as, as my colleague has said, I think this is a really great time to expend this, this uh, preventative dollar, uh, and I think that will help us. So I'm fully supportive of the motion, Madam Chair. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions? All right, Chair will entertain a motion for approve, to approve the expenditure totaling 1021 uh, $121,865.60. I'll make that motion that we uh, adopt a staff's recommendation. Second. It's been first and seconded. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Dr. Gale? Yes. Gould? Aye. Orzali? Aye. Jones? Aye. Wood? Aye. Sheets? Aye. Clark? Aye. And Kelly? Aye. Motion passes. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Director. And uh, good luck. Thank you. you won't need it because you take care of all the have to do's. <laughs> Luck's always good. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. All right, our second action item <clears throat> of the evening is the Sacramento Local Agency Formation Commission nominations for the Consolidated Redevelopment Oversight Board. Uh, and it goes to the uh, board clerk and myself. Melissa, would you like to begin? Sure. All right, Kim. Go. Good evening, directors and Chief Harms. Um, I'll start this evening with the item of the Redevelopment Oversight Board. Uh, so what you have before you is the Sacramento Local Agency Formation Commission, or LAFCO, is seeking nominations from special districts to serve on the Consolidated Redevelopment Oversight Board for Sacramento County. Currently, there are more than 400 redevelopment oversight boards throughout the state of California, and effective July 1st of this year, per Health and Safety Code Section 34179, subsection J, the various redevelopment oversight boards in Sacramento County will be consolidated into one. So LAFCO may appoint one member from the special districts that are eligible to receive property taxes. And those special districts were outlined in Table A. They were found on page 16 of your board packet. And you probably noticed that Metro Fire is one of those agencies. And so tonight, in order to nominate a representative and or alternate representative, the nomination must be made by a majority vote during an official board meeting and submitted to LAFCO no later than April 17th. And so that was a little bit of the background on what's before you, and I'll turn it over to Director Jones for the rest of the presentation. Thank you very much, <laughs> Madam Clerk. Uh, we're following the same selection process as we do for the special district nominations for the two special district seats on LAFCO. Uh, we, Metro is in a terrific uh, position with a great opportunity to participate in this. <coughs> and I would like to take this time, this moment, to nominate our uh, Amanda Thomas, our Chief Financial Officer, for the position on the Consolidated Redevelopment uh, Commission. And I would also like to nominate Jeff Fry as an alternate nominee. Uh, if, this, if that's the desire of this board, we, we will nominate them and they will, uh, within the next 30 days, I believe, Melissa, there will be a ballot sent out and we will uh, consider uh, selection, the official selection process with any and uh, any and other uh, nominations on the ballot. So with that, I'd like to entertain a motion for uh, CFO Thomas and Jeff Fry to I have a question, Madam President. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. So um, anyway, that's 
that's my motion. Can I get a second? And we'll have oh, yes. I would second the motion. Thank you. All right, open for discussion. Uh, Director Gale. If we, if we remember that the state of California just established that committee at least six or seven years ago, Sacramento County, Sacramento City, some kind of hearts part thing they come up with is still no, now no answers. Michelle Dozier, who is the director of that, I can never find out who pays them for that since there's no money. Dave Gordon has been on there for about 16 years, I suppose, and uh, I, I don't see what, you know, what will be accomplished by that. But maybe mm -hmm. it doesn't attempt that. You know the history of it. Mm -hmm. And officially, there has no such organization. You see Pulu's name there, but Doja is the one who gets the money from the housing, whatever. She does a great job, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. She was a Mobilian, as well as she went to Highlands High School. And I think she was Phi Beta Kappa at Berkeley, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Michelle Doja is the director. Mm -hmm. Well, I very much appreciate that background. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a... I believe this state law mandate here that we're dealing with. Uh, and uh, I, my understanding is that Metro Fire probably has the biggest um, amount of money to be redistributed. Uh, the, the point of this is to redistribute funds that were not used in proportion to the participation at each of these um, um, agencies. There were pass-through funds for, uh, in the hopes of redevelopment that did not come to fruition totally, and so now it's being restructured. There are funds left over, and they need to be properly redistributed to those agencies who paid into it to begin with. I have full confidence that uh, uh, Amanda Thomas and Jeff Fry can handle this for us as well as the other 12 special districts and be fair, impartial, and professional on this. Are there any other questions or comments? Madam Chairman, if we're finished with the educational portion of this motion, I move for a vote. Okay, I'll second the uh, call for the question. <laughs> Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Director Gale. Very reluctant as knowing the history of it. Maybe they'll move into something and some of the mysterious questions I've asked over the years will be answered. I'll vote yes. Gould. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Wood. Aye. Clark. Aye. Kelly. Aye. And Jones. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you all very much for that support. I think uh, Metro can do a great job representing all the special districts in this uh, new endeavor. All right. President report. He's absent. He's not here. We will move on. <laughs> The next one is the Fire Chief's Report, Chief Harms and Deputy Chief Bridge. Good evening, Directors. It has been a busy couple of weeks since we last were together. Uh, as far as recruitment right now, we have out for uh, internally for the Battalion Chief position. We'll run a test in the spring, early summer for that, uh, that role in the district. We also have the Procurement Specialist that is out there. Uh, we had a promotion for the Community Risk Specialist, Rebecca Alessandre. Um, is in that position. Uh, she was a member in the um, CC, CRD and uh, looked for a little bit different job and came over, so it was nice to have somebody from internally go right over into that position and, and is very well liked and very well known within the district. Uh, attended a number of meetings with our command staff, day staff, and with the uh, 522. Myself, Chief Castantini, Chief Johnson, and Jeff Fry had the opportunity to go to the SAC Metro uh, State Legislative Summit. We spent the morning in uh, some meetings and some sessions, and then the afternoon went over to the Capitol and spent the afternoon doing some meetings over there uh, with our friends in the healthcare side of it. Um, Sacramento Chiefs uh, had met recently and uh, had a little farewell luncheon that was followed that evening for Chief Walt White on his retirement. A uh, number of you directors were there. Thank you for attending uh, that. And it was a very, very well attended event and, and very well attended by uh, a lot of uh, SAC Metro members and a lot of retirees. So it was a nice event. Uh, the last thing I did was just on St. Patty's Day, was able to go down and see 
uh, our firefighters together with the city firefighters marching downtown. Uh, and they had a nice event afterwards that was down there. That ends my report unless you have some questions. And the trophy, the nice oh. trophy. If anybody didn't notice it. <laughs> Are there any questions for the I fire chief? to the chief. Since the director the Chamber of Commerce plays a, such a valuable, uh, supposedly, role in here, I would like to be invited, knowing when those meetings are, so that I can attend them. For strange reason, that doesn't seem to get around quite often. Okay. The one main meeting that we attend, we are a member of the, of of the chamber, are. and the main meeting that we t attend is that uh, legislative summit. But we'll make and, sure that... And cap to cap. And cap to I cap. I did it two years for Sacramento Suburban Water District. So and we'll make sure that uh, those meetings are, are sent out to you as far as when they are. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other? If there are no further questions for the chief, we'll move to ops report. Uh, chief Bridge. <clears throat> oh, back again. Good evening. I'll uh, be short for tonight's report. We, uh, we're tracking right along between every two week intervals with these board reports for about 3,500 calls. Uh, but recently, we've been, the last few days have been with this weather. It's been crazy uh, busy out there, along with the, uh, the rainfall accumulations we're seeing. But um, with increased uh, amount of structure fires over the last few weeks as well, we're seeing that it creates more opportunities for us on the roadway. And um, we, uh, we were fortunate yesterday with one of our uh, battalion chiefs who uh, got bumped and bruised on a, on a collision at one of our intersections uh, when responding to one of the calls. But happy to report that uh, he's home resting and will be back to work shortly. But um, just uh, the nature of sometimes as we're rolling to a lot of these calls with the, with the weather the way it is, it's uh, dangerous out there. So the members are doing a fantastic job. We're doing some live fire training right now. And, um, and uh, just happy to report that uh, they're, they're taking the training that they're getting and they're applying it on, on the structure fires. I had the crew members from Medic 62 uh, arrive on, on Medic 62 arrived first on scene, which is always challenging when you don't have water. But the good news is they do have a two and a half gallon water can, and it did most of the damage on this fire last or a couple days ago. So they're doing a fantastic job. I can't be more proud of what they're doing out there. And, um, and the other good news is our Saudis who are visiting are getting lots of action these last few weeks too. So good, all good news to report. So any questions? Had a question. Sure. Have the Saudis integrated their fire departments? You know, I remember at the time women couldn't drive or whatever. There uh, are the fire departments integrated now. I'm not as familiar with their operations back in Saudi Arabia, but um, mm -hmm. they are integrating very well with our operations. So uh, I, I do know our. Uh, so so maybe so maybe things are changing. I, I, uh, At least I hope so. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to think. We so have too. our next diplomatic uh, assignment <laughs> so, to Saudi yeah. in front of us. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thank you. Chief. I'm Thank you. All righty. Uh, next up, uh, reports SMFD Firefighters Local Five Two Two. Mr. Trevor Javinson, welcome to the podium. Good evening, uh, directors, uh, Chief Harms, Trevor Jamison, Local 522, Metro Vice President. Always a pleasure to be here and address uh, you tonight. Um, just a handful of things for you. Uh, one, I also want to echo the uh, St. Patrick's Day event. It's a great event to get out there as a group and uh, represent uh, all firefighters from the region and to the uh, community out there. Uh, also, it's fun to introduce it to people from another culture. So it was a, it was a, it was a good time. Um, Myself, I recently, I think last time I addressed you, I had just returned uh, from Washington, D.C., and same as I did uh, yesterday, returned from Washington, D.C., was fortunate enough to go back and represent uh, 522 at the headquarter, IAFF headquarters uh, and have a full day of training and uh, basically information gathering for not only me as us as labor leaders, but also uh, for the district. Um, one of the great things about the fire service is uh, this, what I'm going to call it the labor management cooperation that's happening right now. We are active. When we're back there, we're not just back there looking for things that are going to assist us from a labor perspective. We're actually back there looking for things that are going to assist the fire department. Uh, how can we bring programs, services that will help the fire service 
Metro Fire in general. So it's a great event. We have plenty of ideas. I look forward to bringing some of that forward in the near future. Um, so it was, it was a very, very nice event, and hopefully you'll see that the, that cooperation continue. And then I just want to echo uh, the support uh, on the LAFCO uh, oversight board, the appointments, uh, Metro Fire. I think it's a great, great thing for Metro Fire to be involved in, and I, uh, I hope that that will bring us some great things in the future. So I wholly, when 522 wholly supports those appointments to that board. So thank you very much. Unless you have any questions, that's all I have. Okay, hearing and seeing none, we'll move on to committee and delegate reports. I do have an announcement for the executive committee. We will be meeting Thursday, April 12th at 5 p.m. at these chambers. So mark your calendars. All right, uh, Communication Center JPA, <clears throat> AC Johnson. Good evening, sir, and welcome to the podium. Good evening, directors. Our last meeting for the Comp Center JPA was on March 12th. We had one issue that was referred to the Personnel Committee for Action uh, in which they took, and our next meeting will be on March 27th here in this chambers. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Next up, we have... But President, I got a question for the Chief. Okay. Uh... I began to think that's where uh, Hangar 13, I haven't got that communication to come out and visit it yet. Hangar 13. Channel. But the mysterious one we used to have in the Air Force. You couldn't, okay. Nobody could find it. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> All right. And, uh, so I noted. They expecting I want to come out and see the, see the site there. Okay. We'll set up something for you. Yeah. You know, it's been like a month or so or more. Okay, we'll work on it. Okay. Thank it's you. a good spot. You'll be impressed. Good. You'll be impressed. All right, moving on to um, California Fire and Rescue Training JPA, D.C. Shannon. Welcome to the <laughs> Good evening. Board. We haven't met since January. Uh, we will not meet again until uh, June 21st, 4 o'clock next door in the SESC. Whoa. Thanks. All right. Those are my kind of committees. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Finance and Audit Committee, Director Kelly. Uh, you want a summertime routine as the well? The Finance and Audit Committee met this evening, actually. Uh, we received a presentation on our uh, financial report through December. Uh, a couple of things are trending up, and we received uh, a few dollars from the GEMT a little later than we expected, or it was, yeah. Anyways, uh, so mm. things are okay. All right. Thank you for that report. Policy Committee, Director Gould. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for April 12, 2018. Just like to make her aware of the fact that we're one down on that committee. I understand, and as you see, the executive committee will probably be meeting a few moments Yes, before. I would encourage you on your 12th meeting to find me a third member, only because oftentimes we find ourselves in a tie vote given the, the amount of policy that comes through our committee, it's concerning. Hmm. We will definitely uh, make sure that committee is fully staffed, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. We're going to move to board member <coughs> questions and comments. And uh, we'll start to my far right, uh, Director Gale. Board member questions and comments. The yeah. floor is yours. This is to the chief. Quite often you hear the term uh, Sacramento County, what it is most diverse in the, uh, in the country, and I question that. I consider something uh, to be uh, inversed as well as diverse. And I wonder, do we ever look at our fire department as being diverse or inverse uh, with personnel? Is there an outreach or some special effort has been made to live by that symbol in America that we are diverse and that kind of rhetoric you have quite often. What effort are we doing? The, the um, district has a long history of recruitment and through that recruitment program there has been a, uh, a emphasis put on diversity uh, I think that you attended an event just recently. Yeah, I was and proud of our organization. Yeah, yes. Thank you. And one of the um, important goals is that ability to mimic the community that we served. Uh, I'll be the first to say, though, is that we struggle. I, I and can imagine. 
Uh, there's a lot of other folks that we compete with. There is a lot of standards that we um, are held to or that we hold the people to that are coming in. So it is always a challenge for us, um, but it is one of those primary goals within the organization is how do we fill the ranks and, the, and the, the positions within. And also as we promote through the organization is how do we encourage that diversity as we, as we move forward. Um, but as you saw, the, the members that are out there uh, interacting uh, from the recruitment group, uh, there's probably not a week that goes by that there isn't somewhere I'm on their email group that they're working. Uh, but one of the things I think that has happened uh, within the last couple of years is that ourselves and the communities around us have partnership together and saying together as a group we're stronger and not that we're trying to steal from one organization to another but working together, going together and uh, the city has taken the lead in a diversity work group and, and we're a part of that as we move forward. But it is a struggle for us. Okay, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, Director Gould. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to say thank you to all the men and women who work for this agency. Keep up the great work that you do every single day. Thank you. Director Rosale. Two things. One, I wanted to thank Amanda for her report um, earlier this evening. And um, she and her staff do a fantastic job for us. Second, I was honored to be at uh, the retirement of Chief Walt White. It was a great um, uh, evening, and Walt is, uh, is I think, enjoying a well-deserved retirement. He's done a fine job, so thank you. Director Sheets? Oh, I'm, you know what? We are, we're going to follow protocol here. We'll go to Director Woods. Thank you, we'll uh, Madam Chair. I just have a couple of things I want to say. Um, for those of you who don't realize it, um, the Chief Harms' trophy, the 10000 that he re, re, he recruited, $10,000 he recovered, of the 17000 that the six chiefs did represents 58% of uh, that work. So that's absolutely amazing uh, when you look at, at that by percentage. The other thing, uh, the firefighters staying on the Firefighters Burn Institute, their tropical affair is on June 23rd of this year. Uh, the Boot Drive is one of their biggest fundraisers, but Tropical Affair is another one of their biggest ones. And it's, it's an absolutely awesome time, wonderful time. It's a no-brainer. It's, it's so easy to support the Burn Institute by going. Uh, last year, we had five of our directors, uh, a number of other staff, you know, command staff and, and members uh, are also there. But uh, from our perspective, I think we need to do better than five of nine. And uh, I hope we do better than that this year. Um, and I hope to see all of you there at the burn inst at the uh, tropical affair. Uh, la uh, two things, two more things. Uh, I was able to go spend some time with uh, uh, the crew at Station 68 on March 11th, and I want to thank Captain Ben Cargill, Engineer J.B. Lee, and Firefighter Dwayne Miller for their hospitality. Got to sit there with them for about two and a half hours and um, just listen to their com concerns and comments and questions and. Had a real good conversation, so I thank them for that. And last, I just want to wish uh, Charlie Jenkins, who's a personal friend of mine as well as uh, one of our chiefs, I just want to wish him a very speedy recovery uh, from his accident yesterday. So thank you. Thank you, Director <clears throat> Woods. Director Clark? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, I, don't, I do not have any comments or questions this evening. Thank you. Clark. Director Kelly? Uh, nothing from me, thank you. All right. Director Sheets. Uh, good evening. I wanted to thank uh, all the presentations, Investigator Barsdale and uh, Chief Wagman for your um, presentation. Um, also, uh, Monty um, for the presentation. That was uh, great. Uh, congratulate Chief uh, Walt on his retirement and um, uh, echo uh, the same um, for Chief uh, Jenkins on a speedy recovery. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I uh, also echo all the comments from all of my directors, my fellow directors, and uh, I accept the challenge to be present at the Tropical Affair. With that, we're going to uh, uh, go to closed session. Uh, we thank the audience for their participation. Uh, no means, manner, or way do you need to be here when we come back. Thank you all very much. We
Do you like not sell calls? Do you, do you care about selling? Oh, no, yeah, please call me. Sell them. Good evening, everyone. Uh, reconvening to open session. Uh, Council, would you please report out on closed session items? <clears throat> yes, thank you, Director Jones. The board met uh, on item one uh, concerning the workers' compensation claim of employee uh, Robert Bruce. Uh, by unanimous vote, the board agreed to give authority to its third-party administrator to effectuate a settlement of that uh, claim. The board also met with uh, legal counsel regarding anticipated litigation under government code section 54956.9 subsection C. No action was taken. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll announce that our next meeting will be April, April 12th, 6 p.m. in these quarters, and this meeting is adjourned.